Hey guys, I'm super excited because in today's bonus episode, we have our own Jordan Tate in the middle of nowhere, Idaho, or at least I think it's middle of nowhere, Idaho. And he has some exciting news. It's been the program now for about a year and a half. And so check this interview out. Hopefully you'll get some value from it. Let's dive in. All right, everybody, welcome back to the podcast. Welcome back to the show. We are so excited because we got another bonus episode today with Zach, Keith, and Luke. What's up, Keith? What's up, Luke? How's it going, Zach? Good to see you. Happy to be on again. Good to see you guys. It is a Friday, and so everyone's wrapping up, finishing the week strong. Hopefully, you guys busy today? Oh, yeah. Ridiculous. But uh, I'm ready to get at it, man. We got a good, we got a good one today. Yeah, we got yeah. a good one. We got we got Jordan on the on the line, the head yeah. hitter. So without further ado, we're gonna introduce our guest today. Jordan, he's been with us for a long time now. I don't know exactly. I'll let him share, but uh we got Jordan Tate in the middle of nowhere, Idaho, <laughs> who is crushing it inside of the Woodworking Business Accelerator program. So welcome to the podcast. Welcome to the show, Jordan. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, it's uh yeah, middle of nowhere, Idaho is not a lie. I guess it is. It is a little bit of a lie. Lex, Rexburg is like the sixth biggest city in Rexburg or in uh, Idaho, which is kind of the same as being the world's tallest midget. It's uh, <laughs> I like not, it. It's not <laughs> saying much. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, man, uh, I want to just spend some time with you today. Us just hanging out, asking you questions about your business, what's working, what's not working, where where you've been, where you are now you know, pros and cons of the program, just kind of letting people that are maybe on the fence or considering it or curious about what this really looks like, kind of letting them see the behind the scenes, like what is really happening inside the Woodworking Business Accelerator program? What is it like to experience the results? Is it a constant up or is there some rocky parts <laughs> yeah. in it? You know, what does that look like? So yeah, first yeah. of all, first question I'll ask you is, how did you first come across my stuff and uh, kind of talk, tell, fill me in on your business before you came across my stuff? Like, what did you build? What were your yeah. revenue numbers? Stuff like that. Yeah. So, so I don't have much of a background in woodworking. Um, my background is in sales mostly. Um, and actually my degree is in theater. So I, uh, I, I was uh, working as a car salesman. Uh, I, I eventually became the finance manager at a car dealership, and I did that for a couple of years. Then uh, the owners decided they wanted um, their son to learn the business, and so they let me go and put him in my office. Um, and so then I uh, was just kind of wandering. I went to another sales job selling power sports, and I liked it, but uh, I was praying one day, trying to decide what to do with my future. And this was the answer that I got. Now, like six years ago, I had decided that I wanted to start building stuff out of wood. So I spent like a thousand bucks on some cheap tools and I, I built my first table and it was garbage. It was, I mean, it was <laughs> cupped. It was made out of dimensional lumber. It was like all it of was us. a piece of junk. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. My first, my yeah. first table was rubbish. But then I sold it to this lady for like 300 bucks and she's like, you could sell these for a lot more. And I was like, not this, I couldn't, this is, this is <laughs> crap. <laughs> so um, anyway, I, that was the, that was the only one that I had sold ever before um, the Lord told me to quit my job and do this full time. So uh, for years I had been uh, buying and selling rental properties. And so I had uh, three at that, at that time. And I sold one of them so that I could build a shop on the side of my house. Um, but I was in my garage, just, you know, 350 square foot garage for the first year, year and a half or something while we were getting the shop uh, built up. Um, and just kind of selling whatever anyone wanted me to build. Uh, and then when I moved into the shop, that was only 800 square feet. And that was the same situation. Um, just building whatever anyone wanted retooling every time I had to do something. I did a, I did a built-in library in someone's house, just bookshelves all over the place. And I did a couple of tables. I did some patio furniture, you know, just whatever anyone wanted. I, I made these like little flowers, just stupid little stuff, but I was only making like three to 4,000 a month in gross revenue. So net, I was, I really wasn't making hardly any money. And I, I had to sell one of my rental properties just to be able to keep my family afloat while that was happening, Mm. just so that we had the money to live. And then I had to do it again. (laughs) 
um, before I came across uh, my uh, or before I came across your your YouTube channel. So that was in I want to say April of twenty three. Uh, was the first time I, I, cause you know, I'm looking up YouTube woodworking stuff all the time and business stuff. Cause it's always been a passion of mine. Came across your YouTube channel, started watching your YouTube videos and then, uh, went to your website, found out you had a podcast and started listening to the podcast episodes and then, uh, dug a little deeper and found that you did the woodworker business accelerator program. And that was when I reached out to you in May of 23. It's when I reached out to Zach. And at that point, um, I think I had profited a total of like seven grand from in the first half of the year net profit. It was just, you know, and I was on the brink of bankruptcy again. So um, felt good, felt, you know, I liked what I heard and and thought I'd give it a try with my last few hundred dollars. So I put five hundred dollars in, in ad spend in my first month, which was June of 23. And that netted nine thousand dollars of sales. Um, so I was like, okay, this works. So then then the next month I did, I think I did 750 and it was like a 10 X. It was like 7,500 or something. Then the following month I, I, I had committed to myself at that point that I would just keep dumping profit margin into the marketing. Cause I, from sales, I know that, you know, business only grows at the speed of cash. So sales is the number one priority or sales and marketing is the number one priority and should be of every business. Right. Mm, It's good. So so I just keep pushing, pushing money back into the marketing and, and I slowly increase my ad spend all the way to the end of the year where I was spending uh, $3,000 a month. Um, but it gradually increased. We went from nine to 75 following month, I think was 12, five. And the month after that was 15. The month after that, I think was 14 and then 20 and 25 and so on. And so yeah, these are, and then, thousands, so, these are thousands of dollars in revenue, yeah, right? Yeah, thousands yeah. of dollars in, in gross revenue. And so, or gross sales, I guess I should say, because there's a difference between sales and revenue in that way. Yeah. But we had, we we just kept on selling. And then uh, around uh, uh, July, I hired my first full-time guy. He's still with me. And then February, I hired another full-time guy. That was the same month that we are no January. I hired another full-time guy. Then February, we moved into a commercial space. So my, my home shop was 800 square. We moved into a commercial space. It's about 1400 square and that's where we are right now. But next month we're moving into a 3000 square foot space. And I've got Scott, who's the first guy, Jason, who's the second guy. I've since hired Justin and uh, Nathan now. So I've got four, four guys that work for me three of them full-time, one of them part-time. And uh, this this year's revenue, we've averaged around 33,000 a month. In, average, in, in 33 average this year. In, in new sales each month, yeah. Dang. When you when you came into the program, Jordan, did you have a target revenue or are you just kind of like, let's just see where this goes? No, I've always been a big thinker guy. And so my target revenue is 100000 a month. We're not there yet, but I, I plan on making this a, a $1 to $2 million a, a year business um, in this location. And then I hope to open up a, a second location on the other side of the state where I'm doing a large portion of my business in Boise. Um, I, I plan on opening up a second location there probably next year if I can, if things keep going or not, not, not next year, year after next, 26. Man, I- um, Every, so. every time Jordan talks, I kick myself because I also met Zach in May of 23. And I was like, this guy's a total weenie. And I blew him <laughs> off for six months. And now Jordan's way ahead of me. His, his business is like three times the size of mine because I blew off Zach for six months. So, a total, you know, yeah. a total weenie? Come on, man. No, dude, you just hey. weren't as desperate as I was. You just, you just weren't desperate yet, man. I was, I was on the yeah. cusp. I was like, shoot, anything, I'll take anything that might work. And, and this was mm-hmm. the, this has been the silver bullet so far as being part of this program. So it's amazing. It's amazing. So, dude, like, what were some of the biggest issues you were struggling with before you joined the program? Uh, um, standardization. Um, I, I didn't have a standard product. I didn't have a single thing that I did. I was just advertising for custom whatever. And uh, so that's, I mean, that's why everything that I built was just off the wall. I had i had done a handful of tables before I found the program. And I liked building tables because it seemed like they were a little bit 
I mean, the profit margins were better. People were willing to pay good money for them. And I could produce it in a way that I actually made some money. Um, albeit not a lot because I still didn't really know exactly what I was doing. But that was my biggest issue was just not having a standard product and uh, only relying on free sources of advertising, which is not necessarily, it's not a bad thing, right? Uh, organic stuff, word of mouth, uh, Facebook marketplace. These are not bad places or bad things, but like if that's all you got, it is so incredibly inconsistent. Um, so those, those were probably my two main things was driving up, uh, drumming up new business without paying for marketing and not having a standardized process of building something. That's good. That's good. So what has been, so I guess you could probably answer this question with just the counteraction of what you just said, but like, <clears throat> what have been like top three to five biggest takeaways, biggest game changers inside of the program so far? Um, let me see here. Top takeaway. So the first one is is the ad spend. Um, never sacrifice an ad spend. Never sacrifice the marketing budget. Um, there's so much else that can be that can be saved on before you let that go. That's probably number one. And I'll never stop spending money on ads. Um, the second one uh, is is uh, expediting the manufacturing process. So making sure that I have processes in place that I can produce quick enough. Like we're on some of our standard tables. Um, we can, we can take the raw lumber now and produce a finished product in about 12 total labor hours. Um, and some of those we can go even a little bit quicker, but that's our average is around 12 hours from, from start to finish raw lumber to finish product. That couldn't have happened in my smaller shop and it couldn't have happened without uh, figuring out the new processes and, and the suggestions from Zach and the other guys in the woodworking program about how to join up boards and, and, and finishing products that were, that are quicker. You know, I was finishing everything with lacquer before, not lacquer with um, polyurethane before, which takes mm -hmm. like six to eight hours to dry in between coats. And you got to do three to four coats and you got to, so, I mean, you're literally three or four days of finishing a single product and, you're using pre-catalyzed lacquer has been a game changer because yeah, you're you're two hours with dry time in between to to finish a tabletop and then and then you know deliver the next day and it's hard enough for everyone to be happy. So I mean, there's just just little things like that and and getting the right processes in place has been massive. Um, and then just the program in general, like having having a group of guys that are all going through the same thing that you can share your your victories and your struggles with, you know, I, there's an old uh, Irish proverb that I love uh, that says a, a, a joy, a joy, a joy shared is a joy doubled and a sorrow mm. shared is a sorrow halved. And I love that. I think that's so, and it's, it's so enriching to see, to be able to reach out and say, Hey, I'm having a hard time and have get some empathy from guys that understand and share a victory and get a high five over the, you know, like it's, there's just, it's just a big, it's a big deal. It's really cool. I love it. So this month in particular has been a crazy month for you. Yeah. So kind of walk us through the last couple months leading up to this month and yeah. then give us the big reveal of kind of where you're sitting for this month. So this year started off really good. I had January, I did a $3,000 ad spend. Everyone told me January was going to be slow. We did 37,000 in January. Nice. Which was great. And then February was a, was a, a goose. I mean, it wasn't a goose egg, but we did, I think 18 grand on a $3,000 ad spend. So not great. And then March was another good month. I think we did. But let me pause you. Let me pause you for just a second. So what we define is not great is still like a five or six X return. Yeah. So, yeah. Which, so I was still over five. Yeah. I was about to jump in there too. Cause some, some marketing agencies, they market that they can get you two to three X or three X or four X. But for us, yeah. like a five, five to eight X is like, Oh man. So just <laughs> pre preface yeah. the rest, preface the rest <laughs> right. of the yeah. story. Okay. Carry on. Yeah, I know. Carry on. When I was telling that to my sister, by the way, cause she, her and her husband own a, uh, um, a hot works, which is like an exercise studio thing down in, in Salt Lake area. Mm -hmm. um, they own one of those. And when I was telling her, I was getting about 10 times on my return. She's like, we're lucky if we get four, like it was, yeah, that's a big deal. Yeah. Um, 
but so then March comes around and we did a good, we had a good March, a $3,000 ad spend again. And I think we landed around 32, but then May, June, um, were just really, really bad. So I just got super despondent about that. I think, boy, what was, oh, April, April was shoot. I don't remember the numbers. One month I had like eight grand. I think that was, I think that was, that might've been April. And then May was like 15 June, I think was like 12. Like it was, it was bad again. And coming into July, I had been averaging about a six and a half X return, which again, not bad, but because of my poor money management skills by not taking the profit <laughs> that I had from, from the previous months um, and putting that away for a rainy day, I was struggling. So then I just, I still committed. I was like, I'm never going to decrease my ad spend. So again, $3,000 in July, but that was like, that was like the end of it. Like if I, if this doesn't work, then I'm going to have to figure, I might have to let, let go of one of my guys or something. Um, but then July hit hard. We got, um, 40, no, 38 in July, 38 in July, which was awesome. No, 43 in July, 38 in August. Um, and then this month, I don't, I don't exactly know what's been going on. I just found out that the parade of homes ended in the East Idaho parade of homes. So maybe that had something to do with it, but I just took two more orders this morning. Um, and Uh-oh. with, with one day to go in the month, we're sitting at 83 grand in new sales Yay! this month. So, yeah. Yeah. We're riding high right now. It's, uh, it's on so, $3,000 in ad on spend. a $3,000 ad spend. I, I should also clarify that I'm spending $500 a month in, in Google SEO. And okay. some of those sales were from Google, but I okay. mean, probably, probably 30 grand of that was from Google, but still like 50 something off of my Facebook marketing. And so, Crazy. Like things have been things it's just been it's been crazy. I've been absolutely nuts. And I had a goal at the start of this year to do four hundred K in revenue and it was not looking like that was gonna happen, but we're we're on track now. Like if I can just have an, a relatively average month in in October, November, and December, then we're gonna hit it. So come on. Amazing. So I don't wanna cause any beef or any stink around here. But I think somebody got dethroned for the the sales record <laughs> this month. It's okay, Keith. I'm rising, sorry, man. Rising, rising, t- rising tide raises all ships. That's yeah, right. Yeah. All right, I like it, and that that's the positive attitude. That well, I I have nothing, nothing, no no beef at all with Jordan. I'm I'm pumped for him. Uh, he's been working hard. He does the right thing leads with his weakness and then just takes action. So I'm proud of him. And I'm, I expect bigger months, Jordan. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. Yeah. I'm, Jordan, I'm hoping I'm a little disappointed in you, ma'am. Like I was expecting this month to be like 120. Like I'm, I'm a little <laughs> deflated over here that you're still in the eighties. <laughs> if I, yeah, I got to start, start asking so like... Jordan for sales calls and sales, sales <laughs> tips instead of uh, me giving them out. Yeah, my hey. first my first five days of the month. If I'd have kept on track, it would have been like a hundred and eighty grand. Because I think I had twenty two thousand in the first five days. Like it was, it was so crazy. You, you you scaled your ad spend the last couple of months. Do you think it's because most of our customers are on this 30, 60, 90 day buying cycle, and oh, yeah. all all of that ad spend that you have been putting the work in doing? Do you think everyone's just buying today, or do you think you still have a good backlog heading into the rest of the fall? I a hundred percent. I think, I think the retargeting ads are huge. I think the retargeting program is, is big because the number of people that have said, Hey, or, or that I've even messaged months previous, but the number of people yeah. that have said like, Hey, I've, I've seen your ads for months and we're finally thinking about getting our, getting our dining set together. We're finally, you know, we, we put, put money down on a new build of a house a year ago when we're still, we're three months away from moving in. We're finally ready to move forward. So Scaling up my ad spend was a big deal because the retargeting program was able to to keep people in the loop, even if I wasn't necessarily following up with those people every single time. You know, I wasn't because I wasn't I wasn't touching base with them every three or six months. I just kind of paid for the ads to keep going to those folks. And and it's uh, it's been huge. It's been really, really good. But yeah, awesome, I, I, I wanted to scale my ad spend because, I again, 
I'm, I'm my goal is to spend ten thousand dollars a month in ads. That's that's where I want to be. Yeah, which is so crazy for most people to hear that and think, why would you set a goal like that? Like, I think most people here spend ten thousand dollars, and they're like, why would you want to do that? Like, that mm. sounds terrifying and awful. <laughs> but the goal, the reason you do that is because of the returns you get, and if you yep, can. Yeah profitably spend a lot of money, then you should spend as much money as you possibly can. Yep. So, yep. so just to kind of wrap this up, this, this up, we're going to, I got some other questions for you, but just for everybody listening, I want everybody to understand that 18 months ago, Jordan came into the program with the last bit of money that he had. He was a Dead solo broke. guy. He was a solo guy, did not have a commercial space, did not have any employees in this month, September of 2024, a year and a half later, because he stayed consistent and stayed steady, he's broken $80,000 in sales a year and a half later. I want you guys, I just want everybody to understand that this is not some fantasy land. This is not something that Zach is trying to pitch everybody just to get them into his program. This is reality. This is what can actually happen when you come into the program, you apply yourself, you continually look forward to the future. And one thing I love about Jordan is that he's like drawn these lines in the sand of saying, I'm not going to take a step backwards. Even though I ha may have a bad month or may have a bad 30 or 60 days, I'm going to keep moving forward. And, and that's par for the course. You can expect there to be months where your ad spend return is insane. It's awesome. It's great. And you can expect months that they're lower, but if if we if we live and die on a 30 day time frame uh, looking through a 30 day lens we're going to jump out of the program or fire our employees or throw our hands up in despair but i'm just super proud and give you kudos for the fact that you've stayed on course you stayed on track continue to de develop and innovate and and um i'm just pumped for where you're at now so yeah me too it's a uh, it's it's exciting. It's exciting for sure. Okay, it has so not been easy. That's the other thing I'll say is that I think we can all, ever, all four of us here can say that you're going to work hard. You're going to work yep. probably harder than you've ever worked by joining the program. We're just giving you a really clear game plan to get where you're trying to go. So, yep. Yep. hey, got a couple more questions for you. Yeah. The next one is, this is always, I think, such a valuable question to talk about because you have been in the program now for a year and a half. You've seen a lot of guys come in and that are crushing it same as you. Uh, but then you've also seen a lot of guys come in and leave. And so yeah. what do you feel are some of the factors, attitudes, beliefs, processes that guys do and, and think and adhere to that help them succeed and what are the ones that guys that fail come in and what are their tendencies? What are their traits? What are you seeing between the guys that really come into the program, crush it, do well, and those that end up being unsuccessful in the program? So I'll say one thing that I've noticed uh, about a lot of guys that, that wind up dropping out of the program, half the time, I don't even know that they're there. They just, they, they show up. And it's like, hey, I'm new to the program, and we're all we're all saying welcome. And then three months later, you're looking on the Slack channel. And it's like, where'd that guy guy go? I don't, you know, he never said anything on the chats. He never communicated to anybody. And I kind of feel like that's got to be at least one of the contributing factors is that it not not choosing to be a part of it. Um, I've got a I've got a friend here in Rexburg. He's a a very very successful businessman. He's made tens of millions of dollars starting probably 20 or 30 businesses. And one of the things that he uh, told me, he, he, he's given me a lot of great advice like that grow at the speed of cash. That's, that's one of his lines that he constantly mm -hmm. uses. But one of the things he told me, he's like, I'm spending $10,000 a month to be a part of an entrepreneur's club across the country. We meet, we meet virtually once a week. He goes, and I'm spending $10,000 just to be a part of that because you need the community. An entrepreneur's yeah. job is, is a hard job. It's not an easy job and not everyone has it mentally. And so you need people that can support you. You need a support system. And this, this program, especially for woodworkers, furniture builders, this, this is the, it, this is the, 
I was going to say something like, I was going to swear. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> this is, this is the program. This is, I've never known a better one for what we do. Um, and I've been a part of a few of them, some BNI groups and stuff. And I just feel like this is so essential um, for what we do. So that's, that's one thing that I think both in the good and bad, if you want to be successful, contribute and, and be a part of the community. If you don't want to, then don't be a part of the community. Um, and it also seemed like the guys that, that fell out didn't really follow any of the advice. Like they, they kind of felt like they knew better. Um, they knew better than anyone else did. And so that just kind of, yeah, you got to have the humility to recognize that you're, you, you joined the program because you thought it had something to offer and your best thinking got you to where you are. So if you want to get anywhere, maybe you need to question your own thinking. Maybe you need to borrow someone else's brain for a while. So those, those are some of the things that I feel like that I've noticed from guys that, that drop out. They're just, they don't, they tend to question everything else because they think they have all the answers and they don't contribute to the community. Hmm. That's good. The way you said that was really, really good. It's like, you need to borrow your thinking has gotten you to where you are. And you need to borrow somebody else's knowledge for a little bit. And I think that that is just the most simplest way to say, like, if you already knew everything you needed to know to be where you want to be, you would already be there. And exactly. And you're not there. Therefore, you don't know everything you need to know. This is one thing that I talk all the time about. And uh, this is something that Luke always gives me kudos for, but. The difference between where you are and where you want to be is not a hard work problem. It's a knowledge problem. And it's a, Mm -hmm. it's a, I don't, I just simply haven't experienced or seen what I need to in order to Mm -hmm. get where I'm trying to go. And that's what is so beneficial about the group as a whole and about the coaches and, and everything inside the program. So hang on one sec, you guys, I got I promised my wife I'd send her a pin for a location and she's begging for it right now. I got to send that to her real quick, bro. Yeah. yeah. Go while, for it. while you're doing that, Jordan, I think just to piggyback off Jordan's last comment and your last comment, Zach, it's so, it's so helpful to have people that are going through things, the same things to give counsel and, and guidance so that you can just point and shoot instead of just wondering where to aim, wondering where to go, wondering what to do, you know, going from a solo shop to a part-time employee from a part-time to full-time from a garage to a shop. There's a lot of things to consider. Um, it's not just production related. It's just like managing people, managing customers, managing the volume of customers that you end up having. There's so many things that you don't think about or don't know. You don't know what you don't know until you're in it. And then having other people that are in it that have gone through it and have had success that you can, you can talk to and um, just bounce things off. is super awesome. That's one thing I, I, that's one thing I love doing is sharing my experience. And then if I don't know something, we punt it to the general chat, we, we punt it to the group and between, between the 40 or you know so people in the group, you get some great advice and fairly quickly, usually. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. So just to, uh, I got a couple more questions for you here, man. Um, yeah, shoot. But so you've grown to this point. You've already mentioned that, hey, I'm really want to take this to a, you know, one to two million dollar business. I want to op- open a couple more locations. One thing that we don't talk a lot about, but is very uh, real is what I know that those are your goals. What are the costs going to be at? associated from not just from a mental stand not just from a financial standpoint but from a mental uh emotional um financial standpoint of reaching your goals and so to get to from where you were to where you are now what does it cost you what did it take to get there and then what do you foresee it taking to get to where you're trying to go awesome question Oh boy. Um, well, I, I mean, I'll say, so I'll start with the easy one, which was financially. Um, because when I started this, I, like I mentioned, I, I had a few rental properties. I don't have any more now because I didn't, 
know what I didn't know. Um, and I tried to grow too fast um, without having a program, without really knowing what I was doing. So if I had started, I'd be way better off now if I had if I had found you honestly in like 2022. I I I wouldn't I would still have my rental properties. But because I didn't know what I was doing and because I expected things to turn without actually having a pathway to get there, I just kept sinking money into my into my business and that was a that was a massive problem. And I I, I shouldn't say sinking money into the business. I was sinking money into my living expenses. I didn't take a paycheck for the first two years. Yeah. And that's, and that's where all my money went was just living my family, just being able to live. So, um, that was the easy one. It's going to, it's going to take some money. Uh, although again, if I'd have found you my first month of business, I probably would still have all my properties. I probably wouldn't have, you know, needed to go into debt or anything. It would have been, you know, things just would have been rocking and rolling from the start. Um, so mentally and emotionally, you've got to become just like this ninja. <laughs> like you've got to just shut out negative thoughts every single time because they come no matter what I I've come to realize that there are a handful of, of truths in this life. And in my experience, they all have to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And after that, it's all subjective. You can believe just about anything you want to believe about your potential, about what's what's worth it in this life, about where you can go, about what you can do. And whether or not we believe it or whether or not you want to believe this truth, everyone is telling themselves a story every single day yep. about what we can do, where we will go, what we should do, what we shouldn't do. Everybody's telling themselves a story. If you're going to tell yourself a story, why not choose one that's going to support your goals? Why not choose you? Choose one that's going to compliment you, that's going to lift you up. That has been such a hard thing to wrap my mind around that every single time a customer complained about something or every single time I, I, I screwed something up in the wood shop and every single time I had to redo a tabletop or every single time something screwed up and I had to fix it, the voice in my head kept saying, yeah you can't you can't do that no yeah you screwed up again and see that's what you really are you're a screw up and so you got to become this mental ninja to just shut those voices down and say no 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 i'm not i'm not listening today we're not we're not playing that song today one of my uh my dad used to pay me when i was a kid to memorize scriptures and poems and uh he'd give me like a he'd find a poem that he liked to give me a dollar to memorize it some of those some of those have become my best friends growing up um but one of them was uh uh, I never memorized the full poem, but it's called The Race by D.H. Groberg. But it's about a little kid who's in a race, a foot race with other other little boys. And he keeps tripping and falling. And every single time he falls, oh, I'm going to get emotional. Every single time he falls, his uh, he looks up in the crowd and he sees his dad fa- his dad's face, which so clearly in his mind says, get up and win the race. And mm. so that's the voice that that keeps playing. Um, and the, the last stanza of the poem says uh, something like, and whenever I, I hang my head in front of, front of a failure's face, another voice inside me says, get up and win that race. So you, that's, that's probably the hardest challenge. And the biggest cost is releasing what I thought was true for, for a better story, for a more supportive truth, for something else that, that helped push me forward to shut out the negative voices. That's amazing. Dude, that, that's Woo! huge inside a business because it, it happens every day. And, you know, and there, there are like these seasons. And, and so, you know, you get into a season of customers that are really challenging, you know, mm-hmm. and that as the entrepreneur oftentimes affects you, you know, it almost feels like a personal attack sometimes when yeah. customers are upset over a product and, and hearing those things or then when mistakes happen out in the shop or you lose money or whatever it is, man, all those negative thoughts, they, they happen. Like that's real, you know, we're, yeah. we're not being sunshine and rainbows right now. Like that's just legit and part of business, dude. That's, yeah. that's huge. Yeah. It's a challenge. I mean, and especially because most people that are, that are, most people live lives of quiet desperation and go to the grave with a song still in them. Right. Then so the idea of trying to change your thought process that that really is the only thing that separates you from the gods in this world is 
is just thinking differently. You don't know what you don't know, but you can tell yourself a story that will build you up or will tear you down. And it is your choice. I love what you just said. One of my favorite quotes ever is most men lead lives of quiet desperation. And there's somebody watching this right now or listening to this right now. And every fiber of their being is telling them to go for it, to give it a try, to, to go, to do it. But they're afraid of what their friends are going to think. They're afraid of what, of trying to explain it to their spouse. They're afraid of risking it because they've got a mortgage and they've got kids and they got all these things that this social construct has given them of like, well, you can't take risks because if you take risks and if you fail, well, then you're going to b- destroy your whole family. You know, everyone's going to judge you. Everyone's going to have an opinion about you. Just a just a real quick uh, little caveat here. Everyone already has an opinion about you. Mm-hmm. Everyone has an opinion about you of what you are doing that they don't like or what you aren't doing that they don't like or how you should have said something or should have done something. And so I kind of live, try to live my life from like, did the Lord tell me to do it? Is it a command in the Bible? Is it something that he's downloaded to me through prayer? Or in it, and on top of that, is this something that I'm passionate about? And everyone asks himself, well, what happens if it doesn't work? But nobody wants to ask himself, like, what happens if I succeed wildly? Like, what happens yeah. if I actually do this and take this where I want it to go? And so just for everybody out there that's listening, that's on the fence, that's not even, whether it's being on the fence about joining our program or not, but just on the fence about going for it, like actually going for whatever the thing is that you have had a dream in your heart for, for years, take the leap because if nothing else happens, even if you don't succeed wildly, what you will do is you'll prove to yourself that you're capable. And I think that that is one thing that every man needs to know. He needs to know that he can progress. He can get better. He can learn. He can become more capable and he can make a difference. So if he can make a difference in the life of his family and his friends and his kids, whatever that looks like, if a man is making a difference and in, in making progress, he's going to be more satisfied than any other man out in the world, whatever the yep. degree that looks like. So yeah. well, last question I've got for you and we'll let you go. We've been on here for almost 40 minutes now, but what is the best business book you've read from a strategy standpoint and what has been like the best book you've read for like a mindset like seeing business differently standpoint oh that's a good question um best the best mindset book i would say that i've that i've ever read for business is the secrets of the millionaire mind by t harvecker um he that one's probably 20 years old or something it's 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 a pretty old older book But he lays out the 17 specific ways that he has found that rich people think differently from poor and middle class people Um, and and gives examples of those. I I referenced that book quite a bit because it really changed everything for me um, as far as mindset goes. Uh, Let's see, business strategy. Probably, I want to say rich dad, poor dad, but that one's really just more the principle of, uh, well... Hmm. I that will un- say that unlocks a big thing in your in your mind. It the does. It that does. book. It's like it's an. There's epiphany. one overwhelming principle. Yeah, but there's yeah, there's like one overwhelming principle that it's like that's what he's trying to get across. And mm-hmm. so that it's not really necessarily a business strategy book. Let's see, there's a uh, mindset. There's um, grit. I liked grit was a great book, but that's not necessarily mm-hmm. business. I don't know, man. I've read a lot of business books. What did I just, what's the one I just really, really liked that I just finished? We'll let you come back. Uh, yeah. I can't remember the name of it now, but you it's, uh, it's, oh, it's, um, it's, uh, E-Myth Revisited, the E-Myth Revisited. Classic. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's another great one. Um, word. And that's, that's what kind of changed my mindset to think like, I just, I don't just want a successful business. I want a successful product and I want the product to be my business. Yep. Yeah. I want to, I want to get to the point that I can, I can build this up so much that a, an investment firm is going to look at this and say, yeah, this is worth 20 million. We'll give it to you. That's what I want. Yeah. That's, that's what's changing everything. So anyway, when, when do you guys read? What do you guys read? Do you guys read at night or do you guys read in the mornings? 
I listen. I, I, I audio book a lot. Yep. Oh, Same. and that's the other one. Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink. That one changed everything for me too. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. 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 Fire that books. one's yeah. Way, way good. So but yeah, oh, that I, makes I, me feel I better because I'm like, uh, I, I wouldn't. Are these guys physically reading their books like by a lamp, like uh, with, with a cup of coffee in the morning, or, <laughs> or is it, are they like me too, just like podcasting? Or uh... no, I listen. I don't have. Who's, I don't have time to sit down. When I sit down to read, it's usually the scriptures with my kids. But then, yeah, when I'm I, or a book to one of them, but I'm just, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't get a chance to read my business books. I listen to them. Same, and I've been doing it for like five years. Like yeah. when you're sanding, when you're working in the shop, when you're driving, when your wife's telling you something important, you know, just make sure that you're listening <laughs> to these. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> but, uh, well, man, I want to just, as we wrap up, I just want to honor you big. Just number one, I appreciate the man that you are. I appreciate the way that you lead your family. You set the tone for what it looks like to love Jesus and love people. Um, I am super impressed uh, by your skill level, uh, the, your ability to have sales conversations and not ever be, uh, never, ever manipulate, never, ever twist arms, never, ever do anything that feels weird or tacky, but literally just help solve people's problems. That's one of the things that I've always been super blown away with you, um, on. And, but then lastly, just the way that you contribute to the to the group, the way that you contribute to the program, um, I am so grateful for you being here, and I'm glad that you're crushing it because I want to keep you around for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I'm glad. Just I tell you a little quick story about that sales thing that you mentioned here. Yeah. So my first sales job, my first sales job was selling Cutco knives at a high school, and that did not last very long. <laughs> but knives. My uh, my second sales job, what I would really call my first sales job, was with uh, a Power Sports. I was selling at a Power Sports dealership up here in Rexburg, and uh, my sales manager pulled me in after a, after two months, and he says, "So you, you seem a little uncomfortable." And I was like, "I am." And he's like, "Why?" And I said, "Because salesmen are liars, and I don't want to be a liar." And he goes, "Okay, well that's he goes that's a fair." fear a lot of a lot of people are like that because there's no litmus test for salespeople. you know if you can fog mm -hmm. a mirror you can get a sales job right yeah and so he said what i'll tell you about is that there are plenty of salesmen out there that are liars and that manipulate people but the best ones and the ones that have the strongest career that they feel the happiest about just get behind a product they love and they just work that's it they don't manipulate Amen. they don't lie they don't push they just work and some customers are going to have objections that are just knee-jerk knee reflexes. And a good salesman says, my product solves your problem, and I'd like to help you see that. I, I mean, it seems like you got an objection, but I, you know, tell me what's going on with you. They care more about the customer than they do about making a paycheck. And that's, I guess I'll say another, one more business book that I loved called The Go-Giver. Um, Game talks, changer. So, so good. So, so good. Game changer of a book. But yeah, that whole that whole idea of just getting behind a product that you love and just just working for the people, just giving them the best experience that you can. The goal isn't to just make a product that that will be equal to the amount of money you're charging. The goal is to make a product that the customer you're charging can't even imagine paying the little amount of money that you're charging them for this thing. They should be they should hope to pay more money than you're charging for the product you're giving. And that was that that totally changed my mentality too. But anyway, just want to share that story. I'll just add to that briefly with some practical stuff. When it comes to selling furniture, sometimes it feels like, how do I do that? You know, mm -hmm. if I'm charging three grand for a table set, how do I make them feel like they're getting a deal? You know, when they're paying a lot more than they would maybe pay it from Wayfair.com or a big box store or something. And I've always found that you do that by providing an incredible experience. When yep. the experience rocks, when the communication is a top tier, when yep. you're above and beyond and you're sending them a letter, a thank you letter in the note or sending them a, bo a bouquet of flowers on delivery day to put on the center of the table. These little experiential type things win over the hearts of your customers. And so that you're getting review after review. Jordan, I I'm going to share this. When Jordan first came in the program, he had like four or five deals that he in like the first couple months where he delivered it. And they gave him an, another hundred or two hundred dollar tip on yeah. top of the money he had already charged them 
because he provided such an incredible experience. And this so, happened two weeks ago too. Again, I got another one. <laughs> so it's just, I'll, I'll be honest. I never got tips on top, on top of my, what I was charging. So that's impressive. But anyways, man, I won't keep you much longer. I just wanted to, I wanted to honor you. Thank you for being a part of our program. Thank you for setting the tone for what it looks like to work hard, to do it the right way, and to also not lose sight of what actually matters. Not lose sight of your family, your wife, your kids, the the yep. the forever gifts that God has given us for the temporary season of business or business growth that you're in. So, yeah. So, all right. Well, guys, we're going to wrap this episode up. If you have any questions, comments, thoughts, concerns, tired of tired of one of us and want to replace one of us with somebody else, just let us know. <laughs> and uh, in the comments below, would love to just get some feedback on this episode. Hopefully this was helpful to you. If you have questions about the Woodworking Business Accelerator program, you can reach out to any of us. Jordan, where can they find you? What's the name of your business? Where can they find your stuff? So my business is Fox in the Sawdust. Um, we're based out of East Idaho, but we deliver to West Idaho. We deliver the whole state. We deliver Northern Utah, Western Wyoming, South, Southeastern Montana, Southwestern Montana. But we, uh, yeah, that's that's where I am, foxinthesawdust.com. Um, and uh, we've also got an Instagram and a Facebook page and a YouTube channel with a couple of videos that I'm not sure I want people to watch, but uh, <laughs> everybody's going to go watch it now because you said that they're like, I'm doing it right now. Yeah. Like, What's the red YouTube. button? What's the red button that I'm not supposed to press? Right. So yeah, we dabbled in that a little bit, but cool. Anyway. All righty. Well guys, as always, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening. Uh, thanks for watching and uh, best of luck on your endeavors. If you need anything, be sure to reach out, let us know. With that, we're going to sign off. Catch you on the next one.